Okay, so at this point now, I've kind of created that transitional edge so we didn't have to follow along the entire time. All of these are transitional edges and they help link the lights to the darks. I've also uh, dumped a little bit more value into the overall local value and I put a background tone in. Now I put the background tone in purposefully. You can see now when I turn it off, how much whiter the canvas is overall. Everything has a darker value to it. Just like in this picture, pure white is nothing like any of this up here. This is None of this is pure white. This and this are very close or similar in value to one another. Um, but what we need is we need that value. We need that transition to the background because some of the tones that we're going to start putting in, like across the front end of the bicep, I mean the uh, deltoid and across the tricep in here and even some of the edges rolling into the bicep and the brachialis and along the wrist in here take on some of the tones in the background uh, through the neck right across here through the skull right across here through the back right across here down along the leg in here and, and there's so many places where the background and the foreground kind of bleed into one another and we want to take advantage of that because again if we're going to build this thing and we're going to make it feel realistic then we have to kind of go all the way with that concept in mind uh, including the uh, gradients the ones that count the most that help transition one thing into the other thing and help bring it all together in 3d space now as I mentioned earlier this is the area that I'm going to focus on so I'm going to kind of get back to that now and start blocking it in with more specific things in mind. So for example, the edge all along the figure over here, in some places, as we can see along here, back along in here, all through here, all these areas are darker than what I have right now, which means that that's transitioning towards the front of the figure. So I have to keep that in mind, and I have to start rolling that form. Now I'm going to begin with a more exaggerated value than I need. I'm going to begin with something a little bit darker. And the whole, the whole idea here is that by the time I get done gra making the gradient along this edge, the transition that moves all through here, by the time I get done and I, I pass back over it with the lighter values, that I will have something that is transitional that feels incidental. Because that edge transitions very differently. It gets flatter up here and bulkier down here and I need it to feel that way which means there's a lot of work going on here to get it to transition appropriately and I could be stuck working on just this one line for quite a long time now if you're working in graphite or in charcoal you have no choice that's the edge you're going to be working on digitally you have more options but I wouldn't use those options as an excuse I'd still try to work it out but because we have more flexibility with the pencils the the tools that we use to render with um, we have a few more options at our disposal that we should take advantage of. Like the fact that light over dark and dark over light don't really even matter at all in this particular uh, instance. Uh, digital doesn't think of one more than the other. It's basically just how you kind of motor on through and paint up these spaces. So when I'm looking for some of these shapes, like the shape that sits through here on the back, through the scapula, I'm going to actually over accentuate it for just a moment. And then I'm going to start to knock it back to where it belongs, but I'm going to be very mindful of the gradients. And I'm only going to push it lighter where I know it is absolutely lighter, like through here, for example. You don't even notice these values at first glance. <coughs> or the fact that these transition this way and become a part of the rolling form through the shoulder through this space but I won't talk about it if you won't talk about it but I am gonna paint it and I'm gonna try to hide it so we don't have to talk about it <laughs> um, but really what I'm what I'm doing is trying to find those those secondary planes that's the next step in all of this <clears throat> 
to transition into the next phase of the picture, we need to be able to up res everything so that everything starts to feel, in his case, more anatomical because he is a very uh, well-developed individual and th the muscles are as strong as they are in their appearance. We need to really kind of play that concept up. And in this case, it's a perfect opportunity for us to discover surfaces and planes if we don't work that way enough. Right. And we should be because this is the way that we should. Everything should be delineated realistically through surface ch transition. And at least when you're first learning, you absolutely must understand that concept. When you start to develop illustration, you'll realize that a lot of picture making is no tan and not gradient as I'm pushing here. Um, the gradients are going to be subs, uh, s uh, secondary to the no tan, which just means the bigger, flatter graphic values are going to be more important. Uh, because most of what we do as an illustration is concerned is shrunk down to such a degree that all of this detailed work is pretty much for nothing because you can't really appreciate it unless you can blow it up on screen or you get a big poster print of it or something that's very high resolution that is also of a certain scale where you can you can appreciate it and not every job we do is catered to that anymore a lot of it goes to the internet a lot of it goes to trading card size images very small and and so what we have to do is we have to develop something that just a appears more graphically um, enticing than rendered beautifully but when you train there's no excuses I would render the heck out of something to learn what rendering means because this is your only opportunity to master in your own eye what it means to build transition and form the way you do through your own hands if you don't practice it here you're really not going to get the chance to practice it on the job because the job isn't going to allow for that uh, time expenditure and knowing whether or not you were successful at doing that all falls under the deadline gun and that just means you don't have enough time to really be that critical or crucial about your own work when you work and you can't be anyway not at the client's expense so the the thing you really need to do then is train very very hard in school or wherever you're gonna go train atelier um, art school <coughs> whatever it, it requires a lot of work art is a repetition thing the more you do it the easier it gets but that being said you have to do it a lot and repeat yourself over and over and over again because so many of these concepts while intellectually we get it if we don't physically do it then we really don't intellectually get it either because it's only through experience where that information sinks in and it becomes <laughs> valid for you so anyway now getting involved with this the anatomy underneath here is what I am building off of I'm being informed by the anatomy along here the trapezius along through here we have the scapula and in this particular instance here we have the teres major in this space and then where the division is up in here we have the division for the infraspinatus and the Terry's minor and then we get up and through here and we start dealing with the the tendon portion or the fascia portion the aponeuroses portion of the uh, it's aponeuroses not fascia of the uh, trapezius muscle and then through here we get into the neck portion of the trapezius muscle and we need to delineate where the striations are and then over here where the seventh cervical vertebrae is and making sure that it has its shadow side versus its light side and because the uh, area up here is facing further away from us the value should be a little darker there's all these things that go through my mind as I'm starting to render these things out that I'm being very careful of and all the previous steps are helping inform me of the information that I need to create in here the visual information that's going to help delineate these areas in the appropriate way um, I need to know that as I come down through here this is the division of the scapula 
and this is where the infraspinatus is and the division to the teres major through here. This is the rhomboid in this section along through here. And I can clearly see the delineation along here of the trapezius muscle over the latissimus muscle, just like I can see the delineation of the latissimus muscle. It's all there and it's all visible. It's just, if you don't see it, it's because you don't know it exists there or you understand the information, but you've never quite understood it visually meaning that you haven't taken the time to even look for vague spaces and understand what you're looking at in totality with total clarity of the information that we have before us um, anatomy is not an easy thing to learn when you don't have somebody who's well developed because a lot of that information goes hidden a lot of the models that you're going to be dealing with from your life drawing courses will be that way. They're not all going to be extremely well developed. And that doesn't mean that they're not going to be underdeveloped. It just means that they won't have visual clarity like this model does because this model works out a lot. And he is very conscious of being an art model with information on his body for the artist to work from. He's very conscious of that and that's why he works out in part. I mean, obviously there's, there's other reasons personally, but in part for the artist, it's for clarity for us. Um, he is an art model. So there, there's a lot going on there that is partly for us. And then there's something there for him. So we look at all of these muscles. We see the scapular division here. We see where the infraspinatus breaks away from the teres major and we build in the teres major, then we can start to see where the, um, uh, the serratus muscles are through the back in here and where they terminate down towards the ninth rib because remember they go all the way down to the ninth rib. And then we start to see more visually the turn of the trapezius muscle once we start to see these volumes. It just becomes more apparent what we're looking at and that we can actually, we do see some of the serratus divisions in there and uh, that we can delineate those and we can understand what we're delineating because we visually understand them now for what they are. Visually, we get it. We understand where we are, we understand what we're looking at and it makes it clear where the boundaries are for each of these shapes that we're creating, each of these facets of value as we're turning the form. And you can see more volume starting to develop here as well. The edges are helping roll or transition the forms and then the gradients between them, making sure that there aren't these really stark spaces between each shape, but that they are appropriately faceted through their own gradient transitions as well. So now you can see with a little bit more development on the forms that things are becoming a little bit more substantial. You can build out and you can make out more surface detail. More volume is becoming more apparent to the eye. And that's what rendering is. Rendering is about building up form and giving it more relatable forms that the eye can, uh, can understand, right? Because we're trying to make clarity for the viewer. That's our goal. That's our objective as an artist. So everything that we're doing is about rendering something to visual clarity or to a certainty that the eye can understand what it is that the artist is, is trying to achieve within the, the image that is being created. So when I render these areas, I use a very big brush. This is about the size of the brush to all these areas, much larger than this, the space actually is. And I'll put in the pertinent value details, and then I'll start sculpting back and forth by quickly diving back and forth between all the values that are already out there in the field because I've already set up a value, a, a value range for pretty much the entire picture. In this space, all I'm doing now is just going back and forth and trying to roll an edge back, then roll it the other way until it has the right sharpness, the right type of softness, the right type of gradation or transition, 
um, all of these things together are the, the things that I'm evaluating the picture with uh, that's included in the lights and in the darks. No matter where it is I am on the figure, I'm constantly uh, making adjustments for the bigger picture. Uh, and, and so like in this particular space, as I start to add information, I realize that there's a, a middle value range right through here. So I might just kind of crunch through all the shapes to put that middle value range in on the rib cage. And then I'll go back to molding the individual ribs back into the picture space. But it's a combination back and forth between building the bigger things and then getting back to the smaller things and having the two of them together work in unison with one another, which is how the body works. We have all these little bits and pieces, but they all go together to form the bigger actions that are taking place. And then how do you disguise them well enough and how do you make them believable enough? How do you make them fit? How do you make them uh, proportionate to each other? And these are all the parts that take time. This is why rendering is not something that just gets done really quickly. It takes time to render a picture. And as you're doing it, you also realize that some areas are just going to need complete revamping of values because all the values are too light. They need to be darker or they're all too dark and they need to be lighter. Um, and that's going to take place as well. And then there's areas like along through here, we need to actually find some information in the shadows, but not so much so that it takes away from the lights. We never want the two to compete with each other. We want there to be a balance between the two. Um, and in a way, we're looking for the appropriate balance that just gives enough information for the viewer so that we don't have to render anything more. So like for the spine, yeah, definitely. We want a darker value in there to help delineate where the middle of the figure is. And then through this space, there's strong reflected light. So what if I just went darker in the shadows? How much reflected light would I really need to pull that off? And there's a skin fold over here, right along this edge. And I am gonna place it because it is a part of the shadow pattern I've created. And then I've got to figure out how to get that to fit with everything else. So I work on the edging of these shapes and I get the shapes to fit according to their outer edge, what they're doing against the physical figure. And then I'll come back into these other spaces and I'll find a lighter value somewhere out here that's incidental. And I'll see if that'll work as my reflected light and if it works which this is working beautifully right now it's not overpowering the space um, because that's working so well I don't need to really go any lighter than this for now I mean in some places I might need to like over here where the folds do get lighter against the outer edge of the figure I might need to pull something in from the outside and then make an adjustment to it so that I can get it to fit and not get it to break the space um, and then that might become my outside edge. But that's also getting the background to become a part of the foreground, getting the two of them together to work together. So that is how the rest of this comes up. And you notice that I don't have a really bright highlight. My highlights could get even lighter if I chose to, but how light do I really need to make them to be the, the appropriate thing for my picture? Like this highlight, yeah, I'll maybe pop it a little bit more, and that just brings the shoulder forward a little more. Um, and then there's going to be a highlight up here in the forehead. But it doesn't need to go too much brighter than what I've done here, or it starts creating a hole that goes right back into the background. Um, but, you know, a, a lighter light is never a bad thing, um, but it doesn't need to be everywhere. This is where hierarchy comes in. The biggest highlight here the next smallest here and here, and then the next smallest down here on the shoulder. And that's my hierarchy. The rest of the body doesn't get anything like that highlight, because as you can see, the brighter that gets, the less it looks like the highlight that's actually on the shoulder in the photograph. But the ones up here look closer, right? They definitely do. So maybe it's good just to keep all these highlights up in the face and forget about them elsewhere and just let the hierarchy of light take over because you're probably going to come up with something much stronger because of that. So that's rendering in a nutshell. Now I'll post this photo later 
and show the finished rendering. I'll, I'll take it just a little bit farther. The rendering that I did between takes here um, was really only about a half hour at most. I didn't spend a lot of time on it, um, mostly because I need to get these videos out and, and it doesn't require that I like make the most perfect rendering in the world. It's more about sequencing and getting the sequential, uh, the, the right sequence of, of events and how you build them. What's, what, is it, what does it take to render better, right? And that's what we're looking at right now. Uh, we're not getting into the secrets of rendering all these little muscles, etc. But everything that I'm doing is based upon anatomy. And if we can remember that, then we study our anatomy more. And remember that this whole picture has been built up all the way from the scaffold underneath that is all of that information. This whole picture has come up from that sequence right there. So let's keep that in mind because that means that there's hope for us, right? We can actually do this. It's not that difficult to do, but it requires patience and it requires understanding all that information underneath there so that you can get what you see on the skin to do what you need it to do in your picture. And you have to fake it a little bit too, right? Like some of these lines I need to push a little bit more to show the perspective than maybe the photograph shows me. Um, but if I don't do that, then it won't read in the way that we need it to read for the perspective to read well. So the, the whole idea here then is to build in a certain sequence of events. And if you can get these sequences to work for you, you're building the picture up one step at a time you can control your picture because each step helps filter the next step or make the next step possible. And so it's a process of making sure that everything supports everything else. And this I like because it's controllable. You can actually go back in and tell yourself when something broke and why it broke, at what stage of the game it broke, as long as you're conscious of each step along the way. And if you're conscious of each step along the way, you'll stop yourself in time before the next step starts and ponder everything you've done up to that point to make sure that it does all work together. And if it does, you're good to go. Now everything will be a lot easier for you because each step is controllable. All right, so that's rendering in a nutshell. Like I said, I'll post the, the what I'll call a finish for now. I'm not going to take it too much farther, but I am going to at least buff out some of these spaces so that they read a little bit more three-dimensionally. I'll post that and um, we'll come back a little bit later for another demonstration and a little bit more information about how to render. And then hopefully you'll take some of my classes and we'll get a lot more time together to figure this stuff out. Because what I'm showing you right now in video is not something you're just going to be able to go run off and do. It's going to actually take you a little bit of time to do. But that's the way how that's the way all this stuff works. So check out the website below. Check out all the websites below. If you've got the ability to take a class online with us or with me, then you can do so at the classes down below. Um, if you can make it down to San Diego and Encinitas, you can actually study with us over at our studio, RevArt. All right. Thanks for sh uh, showing. Thanks for watching. Share this, please. I'd really appreciate it. All you artist people out there should be sharing these with everybody else. And uh, when you see these videos, hit me up with questions that will help build other videos as far as what needs to be seen, what is important to all of you, and what's missing out there for all of you as far as information goes. And I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Take care. I've seen the future and it looks like lemonade. Make you wish you'd never stay